Firo or Dodrio? Which one of these feathered friends will come out on top in a Pokemon Red solo challenge? And ultimately, do either of them have what it takes to roost atop Bird Mountain as the best normal flying Pokemon in Generation 1? We've seen Farfetch'd, we've seen Pidgeot, and today we close the chapter in the Book of Birds and we're going to crown a winner. Welcome back to the channel where the ultimate goal here is to do several runs with optimizations and rank Pokemon against each other. The rules and every basic question you can have are found in the description so check that out if you are interested or if you need to be caught up and this is a versus video it's a little out of my comfort zone and even though I don't normally say this kind of stuff I would appreciate any feedback or thoughts so you can leave a comment leave a like I just need to know if you guys are kind of feeling this type of content going forward but if you are a returning subscriber like Starlight Shadow I do appreciate the support and it's it's time grab yourself a soda pop and let's just dive in We're going to be starting with Dodrio today, and it's because on paper, I thought that this was going to be the clear winner, but we'll get to why my initial thoughts went that way. The tutorial rival doesn't have much going on, there's not much to say, but we'll be going against the Squirtle team today because Blastoise is really tanky, and it has access to Blizzard at the end of the game. I think it's the clear choice for the toughest battle for the, these playthroughs. And now that we're going through the early game, let me talk about the format of the video and kind of like my goals that I want to achieve at the end of the day. We're going to watch a Pokemon up to a certain point then we're gonna swap over to the other Pokemon we'll keep an eye on the split data we'll show who's in the lead talk about why it is some thoughts on that why the results are going the way they are and kind of what I found during my eight or so playthroughs that we did for the video and I'm gonna be honest with you guys I chose these two Pokemon for no other reason than they are the last two normal flying final stage Pokemon so I can kind of wrap up that little story arc to see who's the best we've been trying to do that for a while but what ended up happening is that these two Pokemon on, they mirror each other in a lot of ways. Obviously, they are both normal and flying top. They are both in the medium fast leveling group. But let's compare and contrast even further by looking at both Pokemon's information and we'll start with the stats. The similarities run deep here. They have identical speed, virtually the same special, and their combined HP and defense total equal the same amount. But the one key difference here is that Dodrio has 20 extra attack to bring it to a very respectable total of 100. 110, but we'll just kind of have to monitor the playthrough to see how much of a difference that'll make as everything progresses. Next up is the level up moves, and surprise, surprise, things are very similar here. Both Pokemon start off with Peck and Growl, but Firo gets access to Leer while Dojo doesn't get it at all. And you might think that Leer's bad, but in the early game, the ability to lower high defense targets, like we'll see in the Brock fight, it's not bad at all. In its place, Dojo starts with Fury Attack, while Pharaoh needs to wait until level 15 to get that. And we all know how good multi hit moves are for Brock doing one damage minimum means you can hit up to five and it's kind of a lot now these two normal flying Pokemon they are the ones that get access to drill pack it's not the best move in the world but it's easily the best flying move in the game and Dodrio will get it four levels earlier and both Pokemon are gonna get agility for badge boosting moves but Firo will get it eight levels earlier at level 43 and if you're saying what about mirror move for Firo what about rage and try attack for Dodrio I can confidently and emphatically say right now that these moves will see zero play in the run and they will have no impact whatsoever last up is the TM and HM learn set and while things are very similar this is where the scales are gonna greatly tip towards Dodrio and this is ultimately what's gonna be the most interesting thing to see as the playthrough goes further and further in Firo gets roughly the bare minimum here it's very similar to something like Pidgeot where it's gonna have to rely on double edge to do heavy damage and Dodrio it's gonna get access to body slam and we'll come back to more thoughts on this later but now we kind of got the rundown of these two Pokemon you kind of know why Dodrio is kind of the clear favorite but let's focus on the Brock split and let's take it back to the run and see what we decided to go with with these Pokemon say what you will about Peck but it's great for the multitude of bug Pokemon found in the early game and we'll be battling all three of the bug catchers in Viridian Forest as we make our way towards Pewter and when we finally wrap up that final bug catcher we'll be level 8 I do get poisoned here it's not significant at all and today I'm not gonna make a big fuss about the light 
years blackout grinding, but I will cover it just a little bit, be thorough just in case you're new here. The most simple explanation here is that you get 50% extra experience from trainers, so taking out the Diglett here, getting that boosted experience, and then allowing the Sancho to knock you out after so that you can refight the Diglett on repeat is the fastest way to train. Today, Dodrio only needs to do this twice, so it's not a huge investment, but our three-headed friend, it's not built for this type of grinding. Growl is the non-damaging move used to stall this fight, and it's really slow. You want to keep stalling that Diglett so it can do as much damage as possible because Sandshrew does have sand attack and it can just waste a lot of time, but it's really counterintuitive to the goal because you're lowering its attack. It's doing less damage, it's taking more time. And we've already talked about Sandshrew, it's just a 50-50, so when you're growling it on top of that, it can take even longer, and it can be a real big slog but like I said we only have to do this a grand total of two times a day so it's not like this is gonna take us forever after those two times are up I just I win the battle normally and this puts us at level 11 and it must be said that this isn't a traditional level that you would fight a major battle at with damage rounding levels ending in 0 3 5 or 8 it's the best bet for pretty much all battles so you might be wondering hey why would I pick level 11 and we'll get into that but I'm gonna heal up here and before we get into this Brock fight let's flip it over and talk about Firo up to this point as well. And I'm gonna, let's keep it 100 today. I'm gonna call it like it is. Firo is the underdog, and I always want to root for the underdog. What was cool about the ebb and flow and the back and forth of the versus format was how each Pokemon pushed each other even further as I completed playthrough at their playthrough. And when you're at a disadvantage, you kind of got to scrape and claw and use every single advantage you can get if you're in a position like Firo is today. And I think I can confidently say that there are few Pokemon that I've ever played with that I tried to squeeze as much as I did out of Firo today. And hopefully, you'll see that come through in the video. Now we've been over the relevant data so let's just talk about my thought process towards the end of my runs. And I was looking at the totality of Dodrio's runs and I was just asking myself, what can Pharaoh do better than Dodrio? And ultimately the Brock split is where I decided to trim a lot of fat. And I went for a very risky strat here to get a really early advantage. Just like with Dodrio, it's a no brainer. We battle all the bug catchers, we get to level eight. But the key difference is that I'm not going to do the blackout training here. I'm just gonna straight up fight the Light Years Junior Trainer and I'm gonna battle Brock a level under Dodrio. Now this battle of the Light Years Junior Trainer is not great and just to pull back the curtain and be transparent this is not a guaranteed fight. I actually had to, to test this a lot and restart a few times to get this run going because Peck is in a powerhouse move. I also want you guys to know that Brock at level 13 is likely what you would want to do for a more casual consistent route but consistency and zero resets they've never won anyone any Thing. No one cares if you have a zero reset run and taking risk, it's just, it's more fun and it's faster. But let's fade to black and let's see what our bird friends can do against Brock today. Looking up at the top, let me address the one reset, and it's just from the inherent risk of doing this fight a lot earlier at level 10. I got crit by the Onyx, and the fact of the matter is you just don't have the luxury to tank a bigger hit like that, but it is what it is. Let's talk about the battle. This is going to be about fully utilizing your kit, and remember that our biggest priority here is going to be preserving health. You would think it would be doing damage, but it's not. So here we want to do four growls at the start. It's mandatory. It's the only way this fight's going to work, because it's going to put Geodude's tackle to only do doing two damage and it's much more manageable from there. After that you want to start using Leer and it can take a little bit to get these to stick especially when, when it starts using curls earlier in the fight when you're setting up Growl and Geodude can do this annoying thing where you use Leer, it uses a defense curl and you keep going back and forth. But ultimately I do get it into a range where I drop its defense low enough to where I can just start going straight peck, railing off all the pecks. It can do whatever it wants. I'm just chipping away at it. It's a little bit slow, but it does work. And the main thing here is that we're only at 14 health going into the Onyx. And let's talk about how that actually works out. You want to start out with Growl here and just hope for lots of bods, but it just goes for tackle immediately. Remember, we do outspeed, but this is very similar to Geodude. Growl and Leer setups while not getting damage, that's going to be the ideal scenario. And this attempt goes pretty well, but to speed it up a little bit, this one gets really scary. I'm getting chipped down a little bit and it goes for tackle late but remember at this point it's at negative six attack and I'm at negative six defense I'm at six overall
overall health. And all this comes together to make that Onyx Tackle do five damage, which means we're at one HP, but the dream is alive. At this point, I kind of hold my breath, watch the moves, play it smart, Peck does the job, and it's a pretty close one here, but we do get by with just one single reset. Now let's go back over to Dodrio and the start is going to be the same. Keeping our HP is going to be the top priority. And you're going to notice a trend in this video. I'll go ahead and talk about it now. It's where the strats that these Pokemon use are really going to mirror each other since they're so similar. Four growls to hit that two tackle breakpoint is the key once again. But the difference is that we can't lower Geodude's defense. And I actually have a pretty fortunate Geodude fight here. It's pretty good. I don't take a ton of damage. But the downside here of setting up growls first and being more defensive is that this little rock is going to get one. 120 defense, which is pretty bonkers for the first few battles of the game. Fury attack is what you want to do when you're looking ahead at the Onyx. So I found on my playthroughs just to use Peck on the Geodude and just start chipping away. You can maybe hope to get a crit or three since we do have about a 20% crit chance and it just gave better results overall. Now this one is the definition of slow and steady, but the results were pretty great. And you might think that maybe I could do this at level 10, but with five base HP lower than Firo, I just found that Dodger. 90% of the time it just didn't have the stats and it was just always too low and getting knocked out by the onyx and I wanted it to be a little bit more consistent now speaking of which let's look at onyx I swap up the strat a little bit from Firo and I just go for fury attack immediately this one is simple we don't really need to drag it out but you just go for growl during the bods and since I was conservative with the PP on geodude I can just use fury attack all day I do get a little low that's to be expected but some patience it gets us through and both of our contestants now have the first badge. Dodrio times in with an 18 minute 23 second Brock split while Pharaoh has a rather impressive 13 minute and 32 second time which I never really imagined being possible when I first started doing runs with Firo. Like I said earlier I really poured a lot of optimization and really tried to get Firo to be competitive and you can see right out of the gate it's got a 4 minute and 51 second lead and since Dodrio is behind let's just stick with it for a little bit. There's going to be some optional battles here and I'm just going to give you the cliff notes and to save us all the time let me just go ahead and say that Firo does the same exact routing here. There's no reason to look at both. Neither Pokemon have any trouble at all. I fought the Bug Catcher on Route 3, and then when we get in Mount Moon, I take on the Bug Catcher to the immediate left. Then we fight the fan favorite Super Nerd. That's going to be followed up by the Bug Catcher near him, and I'm going to wrap up the optional battles here with the Double Grass last. For both Pokemon, this is going to put us at level 18 at the end, but Dodrio does hit it a little sooner due to that extra experience before Brock, and that's going to take us to rival number 2. And we can just quickly go over this one. It's not the best fight in the world, but nothing really makes it great. Even if you got to level 20, it doesn't help a ton, and there's just always going to be that inherent risk of sand attack and just general annoyance. And level 18 to me was the best compromise to actually having a fast run, but not making it harder than what it needed to be. I can summarize this one up by saying it was annoying. Both Pokemon do take sand attacks, and you've already seen how close Dodrio's attempt is. It gets really low, but Firo's battle is virtually the same with the rival. It has the same pitfalls, the same sand attack. It just got a little bit more lucky and finished with higher health. And I just, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, sand attack is just a really fun move. I love playing against it. And I just really love that in generation one, it puts you at 66% accuracy from one sand attack rather than 75% like all the other generations. It feels so good. I love it a lot. As for Nugget Bridge, let me say something. I don't know if you guys know this. Did you know that out of all the mandatory battles in the entire game, and there are about 68 of them, that Nugget Bridge to Bill's house has the single highest cluster of them in the entire game? Shocking, I know, right? 11 of them are found right here in rapid succession, and I'm a math guy. That means if you put that together, that over 16% of the required battles in the entire game are found in this section alone, and I preach quite often about how putting some extra extra thought and just doing anything that you can to speed this up will pay dividends and make you run faster. I just I thought I'd mention that real quick because I don't talk about it too much. But things are standard today. There's no struggles, no extra battles. We don't have to swap back and forth. We can just skip straight ahead to Misty. 
And this is where you'll notice a slight XP difference in Pokemon. And you really just, you don't want to be crit here. But Staryu, it's not cooperating. It crits with a water gun. And now we're hurt more than what we would like to be going into the Starmie. But first notice that Dodrio does hit level 23 after it gets that nice damage rounding threshold. And it does help out. Not being weak to water is also cool because Misty can just kind of do whatever move it wants. And that's going to be in our favor here. You do outspeed. And if you just hit with about a total of seven times with Fury Attack, you win. We start off with a four hit and that's great. And the fact that Misty just goes for a couple of tackles is even better. That makes this one clean despite getting that early crit at the start. For Firo, the battle is slightly different for a couple of reasons. The first is Leer and I use it just to ensure the ranges. I would rather use Leer once have its 100% accuracy, then go for the lower accuracy move. It just, it makes sense to me. It also means that if Misty uses an X defend like she does here, I can just use an additional Leer and it doesn't really cost us any time. It goes smooth here, but notice that we don't level up and that's because we rushed Brock a little bit quicker than Dodrio. And while the extra damage is nice to have, Leer just offsets it. And just like that, that's the second badge down. After the second split, Firo is still hanging on to a two minute and 52 second lead, but Dodrio, it's already made up two minutes of ground from the Brock split and why is that? There are two things to look at here and the first one's not that interesting. It's simply because Dodrio had to buy before it did the blackout grinding because if you didn't know you lose money when you blackout you might as well spend all your money then while Firo didn't do its shopping until after Brock. On top of that the ground Dodrio is making up is due to that 20 extra base attack. It just hits harder, it hits better ranges and Firo just can't do that. Now you might not think getting into a battle and finishing it a turn or two quicker doesn't matter but it it really adds up and you can see that just in the time from the Brock split until now it's cut the deficit down and it's gonna be interesting to see how things continue but let's stick to Firo and we're gonna start by talking about the triple Pidgey junior trainer we don't talk about this one a whole lot and I want to point it out now so we can come back later this is a notorious trap for Pokemon that can't one hit these Pokemon and Firo needs ranges to actually do so you have to use the 85% accurate fury attack and you have to hit three times and you're immediately gonna see me hit two times here and that lets the Pidgey live. Now thankfully this doesn't go downhill but I can't tell you guys how many runs I've had just stall out here or just straight up be ruined due to sand attack and it's it's worth going over some of the things that Pharaoh had to risk just so it can maintain this lead and just hang around. The next thing is the Vermilion buy and I don't talk about this much either but I am buying 12 super potions a day. Great runs, really good runs, they don't even need potions sometimes and just the default for any Pokemon is going to be three or four. Remember that this is an optimized run and double edge and its massive damage is coming up and you have to account for the recoil damage and quickly using potions to keep you in the mix longer is just necessary to get the most out of it. It's imperative to sort of kind of mastering that move and minimizing the drawbacks. Next we can all shed a collective tear as Spiro has to pass by the body slam room and instead we'll just grab the rare candy guarded by the gentleman and that's going to be it for this area. And I would like to talk about earlier iterations of the Firo run. This route is what I firmly believe gives the the fastest absolute time, but you have to take a lot of risk like we've already seen several times. In my first draft of this run, I was grinding a handful of extra trainers here. I was getting to level 28 and it was making Surge very consistent and the extra levels really kind of smooth things over and other problematic parts after that. But the fact of the matter is that this is just better. Walking into situations where you know you might reset, but can ultimately save five, 10, 15 minutes by the end of the run, it's the whole point of optimizing because like I said earlier, cautious play and making sure that every single battle is consistent is not a fast approach and it's not how I want to do these runs. But let me just, let me cut myself off here and I want to say how annoying is it that the gentleman's weak little pathetic ponytail actually gets a burn here? This doesn't happen too often, but this is why you pick up the full restore earlier and it just, it always feels bad when this happens. But I don't know if you guys noticed, but you can see how Fury Attack as our highest damaging move just made even that little insignificant gentleman fight drag on a little bit and it gave the pony to the opportunity to pick up that burn and when we carry this over into rival number three the problems kind of continue I do get hit with a sand attack but it's, it's not really an issue there's no resets here but you can just see that I cannot hit ranges unless I get a lucky four or five hit and when you couple that with the accuracy debuff and the fact that fury attack only has 85% accuracy anyway it just starts to slow you down just like the gentleman the lack of consistent damage opens you up to get unlucky like that and it's just gonna result in us bleeding more time over the course of the run and it's just one of the key differences between these two Pokemon.
Let's slide it over to Lieutenant Surge and remember how I wanted to be level 28 in earlier runs? This is why. You need a 4 hit Fury attack at this level to take out the Voltorb, and just so we don't forget that its accuracy is lower, we miss immediately. The follow up Fury attack only hits twice and that's going to leave me open for the worst case scenario and that's Voltorb hitting a sonic boom. Losing health early in this fight is bad. Pikachu is up next and this thing is very frail so we get the clean 2 hit Fury attack, we one shot it. This is a range and in practice if you missed or maybe you failed to get that range it would lead to a thunder wave and it's extremely difficult if not impossible to win if that actually happens as for Raichu search has good AI we are weak to electric and it's only going to use thundershock or thunderbolt we outspeed and we actually crit on a three turn fury attack but it's not good enough and we have to just take some damage back surge goes for thundershock which is really good but it crits that's bad but for the second time in the video Firo survives on just one HP it's scratching it's clawing to get a good run, it hits the follow up fury attack, and Firo is in still a great position. Now let's flip back over to Dodrio and we'll start with that triple Pidgey Junior Trainer just to prove a point. Dodrio doesn't even have to go for Fury Attack here and the 20 extra base attack it lets Peck cleanly get guaranteed one shots and look no further than this example of why this Pokemon is making up ground slowly. Down on the SSN Dodrio smells blood in the water it's time to pick up Body Slam. This move is great we all know that but just to put it into more perspective even if Fury Attack had 100% accuracy and hit five times every time it would still only be 110 effective power and getting this very consistent 127 power body slam with that extra attack it's just going to pay dividends immediately we can just skip straight to rival number three to make this point felt even more and just look at this honestly it makes me feel a little bad for Firo at this point because it's fighting for its life it's hoping that fury attack ranges hit while dodrio just kind of jumps in here one shots everything with body slam and it just quickly gets out now let's let's take a look at the surge battle i'll just i'll sit here in silence for a few seconds and i'll let it play out and you guys you see the dominance here there's no ranges there's no hoping that you get a four hit fury attack it's just a body slam showcase and you would never even know that this pokemon was weak to surge after watching this that's going to take us through three legs of what is essentially a 10 leg race Firo is still holding on to the lead but what was once pretty much five minutes is down to a minute and 19 seconds and with how Dodrio just looked in this split with the body slam power spike, Firo is really going to have to pull a rabbit out of its hat to maintain this lead. Deep in the crevices of Rock Tunnel, we have to talk about the self-destruct hiker today. It's an awful battle for both Pokemon, and the solution to this battle is one of my favorite things, if not the best thing about this run. Both runs, actually. The solution to make this fight nearly consistent was to just spam Growl. Now, I'm not one for pacifist runs in video games, but this is about as close as you'll see me get. You literally don't attack. You just spam Growl, and you just use those attack drops to absorb all of the self-destructs. Now, it might surprise you when I say that Dodrio is actually going to have its first reset here. I don't want you guys to get frustrated like I tend to be sometimes while doing these runs, so I'm not even going to tell you what Geodude's crit rate is, but let's just say that it's not a likely result that's going to repeat itself. And just the mere fact that we actually have a reset here shows you the dangers of this fight if things go south. Overall, I've said pretty much all I can say about the fight. You just growl and you just wait. And the only other thing I'll say is that it's really, it's incredibly satisfying when you get hit with a Graveler self-destruct and it only does 10 damage, but fear also one shots this fight we just growl there too we don't need to look at it let's pick back up in Celadon The route for both Pokemon today is to get access to Fly to let us move around the map a little quicker and then immediately tackle the fourth gym. The middle route with the Cool Trainer is the way to go today and for Dodrio this is another milestone that we're going to pick up. We get Drill Peck at level 30 and learning it here is pretty much nearly perfect timing and it ultimately sets us up with our bread and butter moves that we're going to use for the rest of the game. It also speeds up this battle and when we look ahead at Erica, it's the same type of situation that we've been seeing in the last few major fights. Drill Peck is honestly overkill here and having yet another fight that's just a series of one shots is great for speed but let's flip back over to Firo's Erica battle and talk about the contrast here. Unlike Dodrio, Firo has to wait till level 34 to get Drill Peck so that means that we're just going to be pecking for at least a few more battles. You're going to see the difference here when I cannot one shot and we immediately get wrapped and that's going to waste several turns and just through the course of the battle everything being a two shot means that it's going to open us up to take an extra move, waste a little bit more time but this one it was still just to be fair to Firo this was still a fairly easy battle and the experience is more than welcome 
after Erica, the race is about as tight as it's ever gonna get, and it might surprise you that Firo is still clinging to the lead by the smallest of margins. 20 seconds is all that separates these Pokemon, but there's no time to rest because honestly, one of the toughest parts of the game and the most pivotal to the outcome that we're gonna see at the end is, is coming up next. So get ready for that. I do talk about this sometimes, but I don't skip the Rocket Hideout in my playthroughs. Whether or not you think the Pokedon skip in Pokemon Tower is a glitch, it doesn't really matter. It's kind of irrelevant because I would just like to talk about why I like to do the actual full game. And I think both Pokemon today will demonstrate why it's kind of important to me, but let's cover Fearless route through here. It all starts right here at the poster grunt. Remember, Fury Attack is our highest damaging move, and Peck, it just cannot one-shot much anymore. I want you just to kind of sit here and notice how long this rat kind of hangs around and overall that's kind of a great microcosm of what's making this run bleed time moving ahead there's another important thing and we can all just we can give a round of applause to Pharaoh because it's finally gonna get a move but it's worth noting to get to this move you have to go slightly out of the way you have to pick up an extra battle that's thankfully weak to peck and then you have to pick up the TM, go into the menu, but that's not the full story here. Now guys, I'm a huge advocate of Double Edge. I briefly mentioned it earlier, but it's a nuke. 100 base power, it's the same as Earthquake. And when you factor in stab, it's 150 effective power. At the bare minimum, I think you have to be crazy just to write this move off and not even test it at all. In the case of Dodrio, I do think Body Slam is just generally better, but specifically for Pokemon without options like Firo here, it's worth getting. But we do have to talk about the drawbacks a little more because it really pertains to the race. We're going to take a look at the right side grunt right before Giovanni number one to illustrate the point. And I'm not going to play any games wasting turns with Peck and hoping for ranges or stuff like that. Let's just double edge, move forward, make it as fast as possible. So we're going to take some recoil damage. The Sancher is coming out. It has high defense. And you just don't want this thing to linger around. Sand attack, guys. We don't want to see any more sand attacks forever. So you go for the double edge. We take even more recoil damage. And at the end, you guessed it, Arbok, it's getting a double edge too. Everyone's getting a double edge. And you can see that by the end of here, I take 43 points of recoil for this battle. And that's roughly the value of a super potion. So it's clear why I bought so many of those earlier. Because you're going to be using them a lot. Think about super potions as kind of like the fuel for the double edge machine. And it just adds a little bit of time to the playthrough each time that I have to do it. Giovanni number one, it had to be highlighted today because it was a nightmare in practice. I kind of learned my lesson and cut my teeth on this fight during the Pidgeot run, but the mistake here is thinking that you can use status moves like growls or leers, and you would think that maybe that would be the way to go because you can lower the damage of rock throw or you can soften up its defense, but the secret sauce in this Krabby Patty for this one is just to go straight damage. Onyx hardly has any HP, so the recoil doesn't really matter. It doesn't do near as much as rock throw would, and when you factor in guard specs or the low accuracy, you have a high chance of just avoiding anything altogether. When we go into the ride on, we do change up the approach a little. I do want to avoid getting chipped down, so I do use Grouse here. I use some Leers, and the idea was to use them until Giovanni used that patented guard spec. But we still end up taking a solid amount of damage, but half health is about the best case scenario for this fight, believe it or not. Kangaskhan is where the real problems come in. By the time you make it here, you're limping, you're hurt, and it's just a strong Pokemon to face when you don't have special attacks. I needed some luck here, I'll keep it straight with you guys, and after a bite, I do get the luck. It locks itself into Rage, and this lets me do two Leers, and that's going to put Peck into a two-shot range, and we get through this one without having to reset, which is a pretty huge victory, considering just how difficult this actually was in practice. Back over to Dodrio, and it has none of the slowdowns that Firo has. There's no praying for Fury Attack to hit enough on the Raticate at the poster grunt. There's no additional battles, no additional TMs. It's just straight down to business. And we'll look at Giovanni for Dodrio in just a second, but it's worth reiterating that regardless of the outcome and the scores at the end, I think these are two really solid Pokemon, and I think they're going to have really good grades. In my opinion, Giovanni 1 is the second hardest battle in the entire game for these specific runs, and this isn't an anomaly. This is the case for other runs as well. I guess what I'm trying to say is that while it might 
might be easy to justify skipping this section because you can just use a grass move or a water move and a lot of runs, it doesn't mean that it's never a challenge. There's even some A tier runs that find this fight difficult. Does anything I'm saying make sense right now? I don't really know why I'm trying to justify this so hard. I guess I'm just trying to like, maybe make someone understand that always skips this fight. What do you think about it? What do you guys think about Giovanni number one? Leave a comment down below. Now let's take a look at that fight for Dodrio, and I make a mistake here. In my head, it's really hard to break the thought process here. If you could just, hey, you can just use Growl and lower Rock Throw's damage, but the little dirty AI it says, nah, bruh, I'm just gonna crit. There's nothing you can do about it. Half of your health is taken away immediately, and it goes without saying that this makes the fight much tougher. But Dodrio does hit like a truck. We don't have any of the drawbacks. We have Body Slam, and even though it's resisted, I just keep chipping away. I take a little bit of damage, and even though we got crit, it ultimately just comes down to some Kangaskhan luck just like with Spiro. And the question today is can it one shot us from 25 HP? It gets its turn. Bot only does 20 damage so we hang on and we win this fight despite the dog water crit from Onyx. And I'm feeling pretty good about this one. And I have to say that this was a crucial moment for the race. This isn't an official split by me because we don't want to have Giovanni number one be a split time. I want to keep it to the gyms and the Elite Four, but this is the specific moment where Dodrio starts to really take that lead. It was behind early by about five minutes, and it dwindled that lead all the way down to 20 seconds by the time Erica rolled around. And now, after Pharaoh had to drag its little carcass all the way through Rocket Hideout, Dodrio's faster and just cleaner time it's had since the SSN has just already given it a multiple minute lead, but let's continue with our three-headed friend here. Let's talk about vitamins and sell it on buying for a second. Like a lot of this race, both Pokemon are going to have the same idea, the same route here. I talked about it in recent streams, maybe in a video as well, but vitamins, they're just not that important as you would think they are, especially if you don't need speed. But when you have some future problems like these birds are going to run into eventually, you need to stack up as much damage as humanly possible. So for both runs, we're just going in here, we're grabbing a Pokedoff or Mimic later, we're picking up five proteins, and we're just gonna call it a day. Now I'm gonna swap back over to Firo, and we're gonna coast through the next few sections. They're not too important, but in Pokemon Tower here, Firo, at long last, is gonna hit level 34, and that means it finally gets its shot to use Drill Peck. Now the battle isn't significant, and with Drill Peck, the rest of the tower is just really easy, so let's just forward this down to the Safari Zone, and the only thing to mention here is that the protein is really helpful for both runs, and now both of our little birds are gonna make a pivot directly to Sylph. Both runs are gonna be doing the bare minimum here, all they'll be doing is going up to the 10th floor to get the rare candy, they'll get the 5th floor protein, and I have to bring up Firo's older route once again. I was picking up a lot of extra battles here as well to help with ranges, but just like other parts of the run, like down before Lieutenant Surge, we trimmed out a lot of fat, and we made this run a lot faster, but riskier. And I guess with rival number 5 coming up, the only question is how risky was it? There's a rival bird on the lead, and we have a two-shot range, but you just don't want to see a sand attack, but guess what? We see a sand attack immediately, and it just has me sitting here shaking my head like a disappointed father, but let's play it out. I hit my move on the Growlithe, so things are fine here, but I start to miss on Execute. It sets up Reflect after the first miss, Leech Seed after the second, it misses the Stun Spore on the third, and then the game just gives me some mercy. It allows me to actually move on. Thankfully, I don't miss on the Alakazam, so it's just a one-and-done type of deal, but Blastoise is thick, it's gonna take multiple hits here. Not just multiple hits, multiple double edges. I hit, and it looks like a pretty comfortable two shot, and I'm feeling pretty good about it. And I even hit with the second one, but this tanky turtle survives with barely any health, and after that water gun gets me low, I still have a chance, but I miss with Drill Peck. And the way Leech Seed works in Gen 1 is it ticks after your turn, so Execute just pops its little head in to remind us that it still exists, and we get a reset. It was pretty close, and I'm not discouraged, simply because we lost because of Sand Attack. This time, we don't see a Sand Attack, but we do get crit by a Quick Attack for a decent chunk of damage, but I would take that any day of the week over Sand Attack. With no accuracy debuffs, I'm able just to cleanly land my hits, we can knock out the rival's Pokemon like bowling pins, and we are in a much better position going into the end. We saw last time that I got unlucky with ranges, so for good measure, Firo just, it just crits on the first double edge, and that seals the deal, and that gets us moving on. 
And I'm actually going to skip past the rest of Sylph here. It might be surprising since Giovanni number one was a challenge, but we got drill pack now. We got extra levels. We're older. We're wiser. He has less rock types on his team, so it's not worth going over today. Instead, let's just pick straight back up at Sabrina and let's cap off another split. This one is really straightforward. You outspeed, you one-shot everything up to the Alakazam. I will say that despite Firo just kind of feeling second rate at times in the run, it does say a lot about a Pokemon when it can go directly to Sylph, not do any extra battles, beat rival number five, and then take on Sabrina directly after. For all of its flaws, it really has been a good run. And if this was in its own video, I think we might be talking about it a little bit differently, but let's stick to the battle. Alakazam, it outspeeds. And essentially you just don't want to get crit here because you need to use double edge to get the one shot, but it, that's it. It's pretty straightforward. And at the end of the day, Fero ends this lengthy split with a one hour, 48 minute and six second time. We're gonna flip back over to Dodrio, and remember that these routes mirror each other, so I don't have to go over all the details. We ultimately just need to see how it did against rival number five. And the same thing's gonna apply here. You just, you don't wanna see a sand attack. No one wants to see a sand attack. But the computer goes for a quick attack and that seals its fate. Now to elaborate on that, I outspeed. And when it uses a priority move to go first, that means I'm gonna go two times in a row. So it's a guaranteed two shot. That means it's a done deal. From there, just like Firo, we mow down the next three Pokemon with three easy one shots. And at the end, we don't even have to worry about recoil here and if these runs didn't already mirror each other enough dodrio says hey i'm gonna run it back just like Firo. i'm gonna get the turn one crit too and that's another clean one shot let's move immediately ahead to sabrina and it's virtually the same exact fight just like Firo, we outspeed and out damage the first three pokemon they stand no chance and we could just talk about alakazam i guess it still goes first it goes for a flag body slam does half but I do get the paralysis that lets me go for a second consecutive turn and we just dominate this battle. And now let's take a look at the data. This was a pretty long split. It was from Erica up into now. This encompassed the Rocket Hideout, the Celadon Buy, Pokemon Tower, the trip down to Fuchsia, Safari Zone, Sylph Co, Rival Number 5, as well as Sabrina. So it's a little bit girthy, but just like your mother, that's how I like it. And you can see that Dodrio has started to assert its dominance after trailing for the first four splits. And now it's leading by four minutes and 11 seconds. And as much as I'm holding out hope for Firo, rooting for the underdog, Dodrio, has just seemed to hit its stride. And remember, there's only about 12 mandatory battles left, but today's contestants will pick up some optional battles eventually. Now let's talk about Koga, and this one has some similarities to the self-destruct hacker, but we'll get to that. First off, I would like to say that level 43 would have been really nice, but I don't want to be a broken record. We had to trim the fat, and this is just one of the consequences. It's just really unfortunate that you can't one-shot the coughings, but overall, no harm really comes from it. I slam away, and ultimately that's going to lead us to the wheezing. Now, a critique I can have of myself is that for pure speed, you would just go straight body slam, but sometimes I get a little scared, guys. A self-destruct would deal massive damage and I didn't want to risk it. So just like the hiker earlier, I just growl until it uses self-destruct. And I could have saved a turn or so, but I don't really care too much. I'm not worried about it. And sometimes it is better just to go for the safer play. Looking over at Firo's attempt, it's simultaneously somehow worse, but better than Dodrio. It's worse because it has the same problems with the damages, but Muck, it uses poison gas, and that consistent chip damage from the status is going to make the fight that much more threatening. But when we eventually get everything down and we make it to the Weezing, Firo gets it's a little luck here. Weezing goes for a self-destruct on turn one, and since we outspeed, we do get the growl off and we finish the battle pretty quick. Now, rather than break down the next few splits, let's just keep pushing on. And that means it's time for that swift swim down to Cinnabar, and today is a special occasion. Throughout all the runs I've done for the video, we got to essentially enter the multiverse, and we got to ask if TM28 is actually Tombstoner, brother, or not on multiple planes of reality, which is pretty cool, I guess. When it comes to Blaine, it's a little bit of an awkward fight, very similar to Koga. You don't really need to do anything special to win, but you're just a little bit off of the damage ranges. Now this makes a little back and forth, and you might wonder why not mimic agility. We'll talk about that. The problem is that you're going to level up on the Rapidash anyway, and those are the two threatening Pokemon at the end. You don't really want to set up there, because Rapidash can growl you and that would be really bad. I get a Tail Whip here, and that's good for badge boost, but it's bad if Arcanine goes for takedown. But at the end of the day, we get a patented Blaine dance. 
I crit, Blaine uses a super potion, I hit again, super potion once again, we're doing the waltz going back and forth, and at the end of the day I win. What a riveting finish, I love super potion battles. For Dodrio, I actually decide to mimic agility here despite what I just said. It does take a little time to actually use and set up a couple of times, but you get that time back just by kind of guaranteeing the ranges. It's not really interesting, but the ending here is going to be identical. I level up on the Rapidash, hope I don't get growled, and ultimately I just body slam down the Arcanine to finish up another split so let's just let's keep going Jumping over to Giovanni's Gym, we have a slight difference between the two runs. We're going to pick up some optional battles here and, and a little bit later. And starting with Firo, we'll be picking up just two here. I'm going to just call these trainers what I call them in my notes. So we're going to be picking up the side Tauros Tamer. And then I'll go ahead a little bit and I'll battle the side Machoke Black Belt. And that's it. Pharaoh keeps it short. Pharaoh keeps it simple. Dodrio does the same training, but I pick up a few more trainers here, like the cool trainer with the Nidoking. King. There's another Black Belt found in the middle. And then above him there's a tamer that has a sand slash and let's dive into Giovanni while I talk about that a little bit. The strats are virtually identical here, pretty much like with most Pokemon that don't have a real Giovanni answer. You're just going to gut it out through the Rhyhorn, and then when you get to Doug Trio, you're going to Mimic Dig, and you're just going to use this to win. You're going to take some damage, and it could even be kind of close, but it's a very effective strategy, and both Pokemon one-shot the battle, so we don't really need to take a look at both of them. You kind of get the idea of how it's going to go. Now going back real quick to extra training and why I did some battles with this run and not with Firo, it comes down to those slight little experience differences earlier because we need to be at a certain experience range for the next fight and ultimately we would like to get to the Elite Four managing our experience as efficiently as possible. But we'll talk about extra training soon a little bit more because it's not done yet. But that's going to be the eighth badge down and let's talk about the final splits for the badge portion of the game. We skipped the last two splits so let's catch up. Up. And what it comes down to here is three minutes and four seconds. Dodrio is in the lead, but notice how much ground Firo caught up during the Giovanni split. And you might think, uh oh, we're making a comeback here. But it's because Firo only did two optional battles. And this is going to work itself out in the long run because Firo will have to pick up extra battles in Victory Road. And the long and the short answer on why Dodrio did the training now is that it has just better ranges. So we could pick up some more battles and still fit that experience within the ranges for rival number six not to be a problem. And speaking of which, rival number six, it's not that bad for Dodrio. With the extra battles, you're going to level up on the Rhyhorn. And since we don't have our natural agility yet, we'll just mimic it from Pidgeot, take it out, level up, and we'll just do our setting up on the Rhyhorn. This makes it a little more seamless to get through its high defenses while also just giving our chance to get even more badge boosts like a Tail Whip. And when we come out of the fight, I have four total badge boosts and that's going to last the rest of the fight. This means that Growlithe gets blasted down and the follow-up Execute and Alakazam, they're just little speed bumps on the way to the end of the fight. And when we get there, Dodrio makes it look pretty easy. We do heavy damage, but we need two moves here. Blastoise lowers its head for a Skull Bash and that lets us just get through the battle real clean. In contrast to Dodrio, Pharaoh has to play this one a little different. It's a lower level and that's just because the experience ranges. We've talked about it. You want to make sure you don't level up on the Blastoise is what it comes down to. So we rush to the Pidgeot we persistently chip down the Rhyhorn and this is where we're actually going to level up in this fight. We have agility naturally so there's no need to use Mimic but Growlithe has just had enough of me talking down to it. It uses a couple of takedowns and when you combine that with some lower defense it puts me in a health range lower than I would like but the glass half full mentality here is that I do have five total badge boost. This means Alakazam and Execute are no issue and it should be roughly the same as Dodrio for that two shot range on the tanky turtle but we've just taken too much damage at this point and it uses Hydro Pump that's going to send us down on the mat and we have a reset here. Let's fast forward to the next fight and it's weird that we're pretty much almost in the same exact position here except we don't have those extra Leer badge boost but we have roughly the same HP. It looks like a Drill Pet cannot two shot Blast Toys but thankfully it does miss the Hydro Pump and this time we have more than enough health left just to let a double edge loose and we actually get past the battle. Now I'm going to update you on the splits right before the Elite Four starts, but Firo does need to train a little more. We've already talked about that. And let's just talk about a couple of things real quick. Like we've seen in virtually every run that has an ice weakness, Lorelei can be a huge problem to manage correctly. And throughout this little video, we've highlighted the advantages of Dodrio's 20 extra base attack and access to things like Body Slam. It just gives it a huge advantage compared to 
having to use double edge all the time. Those factors mean that the level we ultimately end up going with for Dodrio is very comfortable for me, but for Firo, it's not really the case. Both Pokemon are gonna pick up the rare candy here and I'm gonna edit out the battles. We'll have some nice seamless little footage playing in the background. You'll see me go up to a total of seven trainers here and the ultimate goal is to hit level 52 and then I'm gonna use all of my candies to hit level 63. Now let me be transparent here and say that level 63 is not a great Lorelei level for Firo. The range is don't really feel great they're a bit off and considering this fight is already kind of rough you will undoubtedly have several resets outside of just some good luck but to remain competitive and not bear the weight of being the worst normal flying pokemon i had to take some risk we had to just eat the resets we had to follow in dodrio's lead and to talk about some behind the scenes stuff let's talk about my original Firo route i've been mentioning that several times it had a lot of extra battles and whatnot it was actually a very consistent zero reset run but i think we we talked about this a lot i think if you went the full safe route like that it would just be significantly lower rating than any other bird so this is what we're going with today and when it's all said and done i want this bird to shine as bright as possible in contrast to that dodrio has already picked up some of its extra training in giovanni's gym it does have that 110 base attack so that allows it to not only do a lighter load here it also doesn't need to worry about recoil damage and healing so it's just much more healthy and able just to seamlessly go trainer to trainer here the route is very similar minus a couple of battles and i just pick up the high points here with the second floor black belt the juggler near him and then i wrap up the route with the chancy cool trainer the grass cool trainer and the water cool trainer after i use my candies to get to 63 it's time for the elite four but let's bring up one final split chart to talk about where these pokemon are at at the end of the game and dodrio has reclaimed that lost time in the giovanni split and it's got a pretty massive six minute and 23 second lead and unless i just keep the game running while i go pet my dog i think the winner is pretty clear here so we're gonna stick with Firo. we're gonna take an in-depth look at its elite four run in its entirety and then we'll come back to dodrio after but let's fade to black let's talk about being level 63 on the ice mistress Let's talk about Lorelei, and I've covered this a lot, but it bears repeating. If you are weak to Lorelei and you have a boosting move like agility, there's a strategy here, and let me go over it if you are new. You want to put some damage on the Dugong. You want to hope that it goes for that turn two rest. Now, if you didn't know, Lorelei has unique AI, specifically on her second turn, and we've seen this in runs like Charizard, Golem, Farfetch. It works out pretty easily, and I guess it's worth noting that in yellow version, the chance for rest is vastly higher, so it would be an easier fight there, but the trade-off and the swapping between the two versions it just it wasn't worth it to me now you'll see here that in my first two attempts it just it refused to use rest and I'm just gonna eat two resets here and honestly it's just kind of luck of the draw it is what it is other things that do make this fight pretty much impossible is a turn two growl or if it gets the attack drop on the first Aurora beam but mainly not using rest so you don't get the extra badge boost it really hurts your odds the most now looking at the third attempt you're gonna see kind of an optional route that's gonna be very relevant for the video you can just crit the dugong and you can avoid all the damage that you take and the drawback here is using physical damage going into cloisters 985 defense stat makes it really hard to get the ranges using double edge is kind of like a last resort but when drill peck only does about 40 percent i have to swap over now i don't think the crit really mattered here but this is going to take us to the next problem with the fight now regardless of the agility setups you are going to need amnesia here to comfortably finish the fight and just like with the pidgeot run growl is a huge problem here and since slowbro is my favorite pokemon Pokemon is going to demonstrate just how bad it can be by putting a total, a whopping total of five growls on me. Now the correct play here is to damage the Slowbro first before it uses growl, but at the end of the day it's going to be really hard to avoid growl in this situation because I have to set up agility and amnesia here, so that's a lot of turns. This one is a little bit funny here because if you look over at the stats, you can see that our attack is just really pathetic, but look at the, look at the other stats. We have 999 special maxed out, and we also have 949 speed but will it be enough jinx comes in and i get a crit here so maybe there's actually a chance but remember i do have 999 special and i can just tank blizzards all day i really do think i could have done this but lapras it wipes all the hope i have for my body it just gets an immediate crit and forces another reset so what's the winning attempt look like it's another dude going crit and then cloister after that's going to follow the same script and it's really funny because we just never saw dugong use rest this run and i would say i would consider this the way harder path 
to win on, but Slowbro, once again, I don't chip it like I should do. But the thing here is that it just misses Growl a few times, it goes for a few different moves, and this allows me to actually fully set up, and look at my glorious stats going into the rest of the fight. Now Jinx is going to be a one shot, so there's really nothing to say about that. And Lapras can still win on two conditions, but Pharaoh's had enough of losing, I don't even have to talk about him. It hits the one shot range with all the boost, and the nightmare's finally over. Before we roll over Bruno, let me just talk about Lorelei just a little more. Level 65 is more consistent, but ask yourself this question. Is it faster to have three decently quick resets or doing a ton of extra battles, gaining two extra levels? How fast is ultimately the goal here? And I'm going to take a handful of resets over an extra 10 or 15 minutes of in-game time every single time, but let's move on. And guys, it's it's crazy. I still get comments about how Bruno's gonna be a huge wall. I guess when you have a channel as big as J Rose, it can make anyone believe anything, but this fight is, is simple. That's the reality of it. Just to cover my basis and give you a complete rundown, you just chip down the Onyx, and it only takes a few hits because it's really pathetic. Even resisted damage just crushes it. And then after that, you take Ice Punch. From there, the fight's over. You have flying damage for the fighters, and you can just one shot the second Onyx, and this one is, is over quick. And I promise I'm not being hyperbolic. I legitimately still get comments about Bruno being hard steel. And I guess here's some video proof of the tiny amount of thinking that you actually need to do to beat this shirtless goon. On to Agatha, and missing some attack compared to Dodrio means that I have to take a slight risk here and set up one time for the badge boost. I go for it and Agatha just swaps out, but what that one agility does is make this one pretty much over. It puts Drill Peck's damage into a one shot range for all the ghosts, and I can use Double Edge, it puts that into a guaranteed one shot range for the other friends on the team. And the only other thing to say is that I do level up going into the final Gengar, but it doesn't have Hypnosis, and even though Nightshade does hurt, it's another first try victory. Moving on to Lance, there's one clear cut strategy here and it's taking that juicy stabbed hyper beam from Gyarados. Nothing hits harder in the entire game except for maybe explosion, but we're never going to see that in a solo challenge. And it's just, it's always a treat to see it, but you do risk getting crit by a hydro pump or maybe using hyper beam, but it doesn't happen here, we can move on. You can easily dispatch the next two Pokemon with no problems and the only other thing to talk about in this fight is Aerodactyl. It's got rock topping, it's going to resist everything, so depending on how much damage you took earlier, it can be risky and you're not going to be able to one shot it so you have to go for drill peck but it does so much damage that you can just use it twice you can comfortably take it down and at the end of the fight is dragonite without boost you're pretty much in the same position as you were with aerodactyl you want to take it a little bit slow you do have to tank a move that's a little bit of a risk but the payoff is worth it because at the end of the battle we get to see a hyper beam bang and that means we're moving on to the final battle Before we dive into the champion fight, let's follow Dodrio's route, and there's two factors that we've been talking about the whole video that makes this fight not too bad. You would love to see rest here, but I just crit. And I love how similar these runs are sometimes. They just mirror each other so much, and just to make it even more so, I also crit on the cloister. But I did these runs so many times that I already know what's coming up, so let's not celebrate yet. But when you factor in the paralysis chance from body slam and the extra 20 base attack, it just, it really feels good. We've seen Slowbro, and I've alluded to how you could chip it down, just in case you get growled on turn one and I actually do the correct play here I put some massive damage on it and then I get the paralysis which is a huge bonus it doesn't really matter here and remember I got crit so I don't have agility set up yet so I have to do a lot of setting up here and when it's all said and done I have two growls on me which feels kind of bad but Dodrio can still put in a lot of work even with the lowered attack now I just crit on the jinx I make it simple just like Fero now it's time for Lapras and I didn't get the chance to elaborate on the win conditions for Lorelai here but Lapras can crit or it can get the freeze proc and you can see that we still do some pretty decent damage but just to cap off a pretty lucky attempt Dodrio rolls that nat 20 once again it gets a crit and we finish this one off. Naturally, we're going to be skipping over Bruno, and let's focus on something else that the 20 extra base attack does for Agatha. It means that there's no setup required, and the only thing you could potentially worry about is that the non-ghost, they're just a range. It's a pretty high range, but we actually miss both of them here. But the whole point here is just to show that Dodrio has a slightly easier time. For Lance, the strat is going to be the same, but remember the risk. Taking Hyper Beam, it's kind of like running over a tripwire in Baldur's Gate 3. 
and sometimes your party just goes boom just like we do here with a hydro pump crit so that's another reset on the second attempt we do get a better result we get the beam we take a little dragon rage chip damage and i am missing a little health but let's see if that's a factor we already know the strat here the next two dragon airs they're going to go down very easy so we don't have to linger and the aerodactyl is essentially the same it's going to be two shots don't go for hyper beam because you can't one shot it we can tank a move pretty well here but now let's just let's move on to the best part of the fight dodrio's extra attack lets it get a guaranteed one shot on this little dragon knight and it makes a little tear roll down my cheek as we wrap this one up but both contestants are on to the champion let's kind of fade to black and see how things finish up Hero's up first and it's pretty simple here. I want to set up two agilities and I want to take out the Pidgeot. We take a slight little bit of damage but it doesn't really matter. Let's look at the Alakazam. We can easily one shot this thing but the play here is to take recover for later. You can take pretty much whatever damage it wants to throw back at you unless it does something like a psychic crit but it never happens. We just peck it down. Let's talk about Rhydon. Now here you want to get some boost with Leer. There's a little bit of kind of back and forth here and if you get hit with Leer, Rhydon starts to actually do a good bit of damage damage but it's really pivotal here to get some boost be at full health but it just goes on for a while at the end of the day i have five total badge boosts counting the agilities and the tail whips here and what this is going to do it's going to make the arcanine and the executor trivial they're not really important to this fight we can just kind of cliff note them move on to the end now what is important here is that there's a huge concession that we had to make to get lore light level 63 the fastest way possible and it's the fact that we're going to level up right after executor that means we're going to lose the boost and remember blastoise has blizzard i let a drill peck loose and it looks like it's doing a little less than half which isn't great and here comes that blizzard it does a lot of damage but not even close to enough and we can finish this battle off with a recoil inducing double edge in style and that sparrow's run over so let's flip over to the other bird like we've seen the entire run these runs are going to be really similar but for dodrio here i just go straight body slam i forgo the early setup i miss the range trigger a full restore i just crit on the second one just like last time recover is going to be the play and it's really easy to do because alakazam it would never go for psychic and it would never crit those two things would never happen and when we make it to the ride on it's going to be the exact same except i have more leeway here because i haven't set up any agility so i can just kind of bait it out a little bit longer and with the extra attack dodrio really doesn't care about the tail whips but the pokey gods they wanted to keep these runs to be pretty much the same so it gives me two defensive drops just like pharaoh before we move on and we already know that arcanine executor are they're irrelevant we don't need to look at them again and being in the same leveling group and starting the elite four at the same exact level means that we're gonna lose the boost and we're just gonna level up just like last time i promise it's just like looking in a mirror guys and we already know dodrio hits hard but blastoise is tanky and the only way the champion's gonna weasel his way out of this one is if he gets a crit or if he freezes he doesn't and one more body slam ends the race with a bang and finally the runs are over So this is a pretty ambitious project. I had no idea it would be as long as it was. So let's kind of bring up the final split data for the run. As much as I thought that this wouldn't really be interesting, crafty early game routing from Firo not only kept it close early, but it actually held the lead for roughly half the game. At the end of the day, these Pokemon are extremely similar. I've said that a ton of times, and we saw that countless times when these things played out. But the difference was the 20 extra base attack, earlier drill pack and body slam. And by the time Dodrio hit Celadon, it started to pull away and Firo saw pretty much nothing but tail lights for the rest of the game. So Dodrio wins this race by seven minutes and 35 seconds of in game time. And honestly, it was a little bit closer than I thought it would be. As for the battle of the birds, everybody's been waiting for this. Pushing Pharaoh as hard as I could means that Pidgeot is actually gonna be ranked the lowest. It has a score of 86.38 out of 100. The medium slow level up group and the utility early is really nice, but no access to drill pack or body slam while having lower attack is, it's what puts the ceiling on this one. Bureau is next with a nice cool 87.63 rating and it was just a solid run overall. This thing was better than I expected and you guys just seen the run, I don't need to talk about it too much. It gave it its best shot and it was just solid. 
Here's the runner up, and the one that I thought wouldn't be beat is Farfetch'd. It has nearly an 89 out of 100 rating, and if you didn't know, go look at this thing's stats. They are really bad, so it's impressive that it was able to kind of leverage the earliest Swords Dance in the game, combined with Body Slam, and it just, it was able to pull off a run better than things like Snorlax and Starmie, but at the end of the day, we have to, we have to all give it up to Dodrio. I knew it would be a contender to win the little normal flying bird duel, but to come out with a run this solid really exceeded my expectations. Jiropec and Body Slam just feel really good, and we have a new Pokemon entering the A tier today, and that puts Dodrio in some elite company. And I guess I should say that there's an unlisted video for my tier rankings if you want to know the math behind it. I have tweaked the numbers slightly since that video, but it'll give you a solid idea and let you know that I'm not just kind of like pulling these numbers out of my PP, but let's kind of get that tier list rolling out for your viewing pleasure. The top three, they're pretty solidly placed for now. I don't think they're really going to be going anywhere, but when you take a look at the next, the little A tier here, they're just really good Pokemon. When you look at this, you say, yeah, I knew that Pokemon would be good. Gengar, yeah, I knew it would be good. Zapdos, yeah, for sure. Charizard is a bit of a surprise by how high it climbed up on the list, but Dodrio is the other surprise for me. And I just think it's cool that these birds are all really close to each other. You start off with the Pidgeot, it's in the mid to lower 86 range. Then Fearow climbs up to the mid to high 87s. Farfetch keeps it going with the high 88 range. And then Dodrio caps it off with the mid 90 range. So what did you guys think about the run? I'm personally, I'm exhausted. I worked on this for like three weeks between classes and I'm happy with the final product, but feedback is always going to be welcome. But the only thing left to say is special shout out to my channel members and Patreon supporters. It means a lot to me. And it also means a lot if you made it this far in the video. Comment real one down below because I love to see it. And I just really appreciate all the support. So I wanted to cook up a more special video and push myself a little bit. So hopefully I accomplished that. I probably need to do some sort of tier list video before the end of the year because I think not many people make it this far in the video, so not many people know what's going on. So I'll think about that. I'll think about what runs I want to do to finish out the year. So you guys have a great rest of your week, and I'll see you on the next one. Bye.